Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 to 12, page 870. The Pharisees and Sadducees approached and as a test asked Jesus to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when evening comes, you say, it'll be good weather because the sky's red. And in the morning, today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation wants a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. The disciples reached the other shore and they'd forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus told them, watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they discussed amongst themselves, we didn't bring any bread. Aware of this, Jesus said, you have little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves that you do not have bread? Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you collected? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many large baskets you collected? How is it you don't understand that when I told you, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, it wasn't about bread? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the yeast in bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, We live in a world of choices, don't we? Uh, The choices seem to increase day by day. And in a world of choices, you've got to actually have discernment to navigate the choices, don't you? Uh, It could be on a really annoying level. Uh, Which telemarketer will I give money to for their worthwhile cause? That needs a level of discernment, doesn't it? Uh, Sometimes we don't take much to think about that, do we? Uh, Sometimes we need discernment to make wise decisions about what I'm going to study for the next couple of years at school so that my HSC goes well. What university course I'm going to apply to and whether or not to do a gap year or two or three or maybe just spend the rest of my life in a gap year. What apprenticeship to take, who to take it with. We need discernment to make wise choices about jobs and what church to go to, what ministries to be involved in, whether we should even go to church. Later on this year, at least by May 21, we'll need discernment to make a wise choice about our federal government, won't we? At various points, we've got to use discernment for education, uh, what websites I visit, uh, what I'll binge on on Netflix. We just need discernment pretty much, don't we? Uh, The problem is we've actually got to work out out what discernment is, don't we? Uh, We tried to talk about it in Bible study this week. It's not an easy word to define. What's discernment if I need to have a lot of it? Uh, I came up with three definitions. Pick your one. Uh, in, a, in a simple way, it's making wise choices in the world. That's discernment. Uh, a Christian author I read a lot of, Tim Challies, has a slightly longer one, but it's helpful. The skill of understanding and applying God's word with the purpose of separating truth from error, right from wrong. I, I've combined those two to come up with my definition. Discernment is the skill to make wise decisions in this world on the evidence God gives you. Discernment is the skill to make wise decisions in this world on the evidence God gives you. And we've come to the moment of discernment in Matthew's biography of Jesus. Uh, This is a book we're spending several years in. we spent a number of weeks in it now. Jesus is God's promised king. He's come to bring outsiders in. Jesus is God's promised king who's come to bring outsiders in. Over the last few chapters, we've seen Jesus perform some amazing deeds. He's fed thousands on two occasions. He's healed people. He's walked on water. We've gained insight into his own nature, haven't we? His character, uh, the fact that he's got a gut-churning compassion for people on the fringe, that he's the king the world needs that he's God in the flesh on water, that he's come to call people from every part of life and every nation into God's mob. And we've seen some fairly significant, even violent opposition to Jesus, haven't we? From the religious leaders we meet again today 
right back to his own hometown who rejects him and his family who think he's stark raving mad. The time's come to make a decision to be discerning about Jesus, who he is, what he's on about, based on the evidence in front of us. And we're going to have a think about that today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, thanks that we gathered as a household, uh, different age groups, different experiences this week, uh, different futures in the week ahead. Thank you that you've brought us together by the king who comes to bring the outsiders in. Thank you for seeing your marvellous promise in the baptism of Brielle and the promises that Ginter and Chris Marie made on her behalf. Father, all of these things encourage us to look at Jesus and to be discerning about him based on the evidence you have given us. Help us to do that today. Amen. Oh, well, the religious leaders come to have a chat with Jesus. I'm at point two on the outline. Look at verse one. The Pharisees and Sadducees approached and as a test asked Jesus to show them a sign from heaven. That's the religious leaders. Uh, these two groups of people didn't get on. Uh, they actually despised each other. Uh, in a moment, we'll see why they've joined together. But they've joined parties and they've come to Jesus and they want a sign, don't they? Jesus, do something out of this world. And they don't come with pure motives, do they? Did you see their motive there in verse 1? They come to test him. Uh, the last time that word was used in this biography in the Greek was by back in Matthew 4. And we know who came to test him then, don't we? And so we're meant to make a link here and go, this is not a good test. This is a dangerous test. And and I mean, what a demand too. Uh, Jesus, do something out of this world for us Uh, because feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 is not enough, Uh, because the rumours of you walking on water are not enough, Uh, because healing people who we've discarded is not enough. We want more. It's not the first such request, is it? If you go back to Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, they posed exactly the same question word for word. Jesus, we want more. It's really not a question, is it? It's a demand. Jesus, dance for us. Jesus, perform for us. Jesus, what you have done is not enough. And Jesus responds, like he did way back in Matthew 12. Look at verse 2. He answered them, when evening comes, you say, it'll be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning today, it'll be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation wants a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Pink in the morning, pink at night. Uh, when I was growing up and we lived in Maroubra, that was the easy way I could work out whether it was going to be offshore winds and the surf would be okay. I could interpret the colour of the sky, work out whether I need to get up early and go for a surf. These men can do that, can't they? But they've completely missed all the road signs that talk about their world and their age. They're just like their ancestors. They don't want God They want God on their terms. And so Jesus calls a spade a spade and then he tells them what sign they're going to get. Did you see it there? No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. And that's why we had that reading from Jonah that Lynn brought us. And a lot of debate, a lot of ink, a lot of trees have been chopped down trying to work out what that sign is. But really I think it's quite simple because Jonah actually performed no miracles, did he, if you go back to the account. A Jonah just existed and spoke. Jonah was and he spoke. His life was defined. Everyone knows Jonah because he's in the belly of a great fish for three days. And by his existence and that thing that everyone knows him about, by what he said, that was enough for how big a city? It was three days to get across the city, for that whole city to be completely transformed. Uh, Gentlemen, That's the sign you're going to get. Just my existence. 
me standing in front of you, you remembering me because I was in the belly for three days and came out. A gentleman, that's the only sign you're going to get. He's standing right in front of you. You've got to deal with him. There is nothing more than Jesus to work out Jesus. And they've got the opportunity to do that, but they want more, don't they? <laughs> You've got to do more, mate. You've got to be more. You've got to offer more. Well, Jesus leaves these religious teachers and their desire for more, and he goes away. I'm at point three on the outline. The disciples go with him. Look at verse five. The disciples reach the other shore and uh, they'd forgotten to take bread. Can you imagine the consternation? I get worried when I don't pack a lunchbox. They've forgotten the lunchbox. That's effectively what he's saying. And Jesus speaks to them. Uh, verse 6, And Jesus told them, Watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then they discussed amongst themselves. They debated. Uh, we didn't bring any bread. And we scratch our heads, don't we? <laughs> Surely these, these blokes have got it. Surely they've understood what Jesus is on about. He's not talking about the bread in the lunchbox. He's talking about the message from the soapbox, isn't he? And they don't get it. And so he asks them some really pointed questions. Look there in verse 8. You of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves that you do not have bread? Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets you collected, or the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many large baskets you collected? Why is it? You don't understand that when I told you beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees, it wasn't about bread. They're pretty blunt questions, aren't they? Uh, gentlemen, uh, why don't we go back over the last few weeks and months? Well, what did I do with 5,000 people? I fed them with five loaves. And uh, what did I do with 4,000 people? Well, I fed them with seven loaves. And when I fed them, was there any left over? There was an abundance left over. Gentlemen, the issue is not about whether there's bread because I've got that covered. The issue is what are you going to think about me? You see, they're distracted by the mundane, aren't they? They lose sight of the Jesus in front of them because they're concerned about high-fibre white bread and it's missing. That's really what it is, isn't it? They've lost sight of the Jesus in front of them because they've been distracted by the mundane matter of bread. And they've forgotten more than that, haven't they? They've actually forgotten what he said in the very first sermon he gave them, that initial training session in Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus is enough. He's completely sufficient. If you follow Jesus, you will never lack what you need to be the people of God. If you follow Jesus, you will never lack what you need to be the people of God. Just look what I did with the 5,000 and the 4,000. Just look what I did to the crippled and the blind and the deaf and the dumb and the rejected. Just look what happens when I stand and people touch my robe. And you've forgotten that because you're worried about your lunchbox? These men, Jesus' disciples, should have been discerning, but they've been taken from the evidence in front of them, Jesus himself, and been distracted by the mundane. There's two dangers to discernment, isn't there? The demand for more and the distraction of the mundane. And we come to the last in the same verses. I'm at point four on the outline because Jesus warns them twice, doesn't he? Did you pick that up? And look at verse 6. Watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then he repeats it down there in verse 11. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Oh, we know what yeast is about. There's been an abundance of sourdough cooking during COVID, hasn't there? And many people have put the pictures on YouTube or channels 
Uh, but the heart of sourdough cooking is the heart of any cooking of bread, isn't it? What is it? It's the yeast, that little thing that's alive that transforms a big lump of flour and water. Little transforms the whole bunch. That's what Jesus is saying. You watch out for what these blokes say. Now, they're not natural friends, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They hate each other, but they hate Jesus more. And so that's what unites them. They're political and theological enemies, but they've joined with the other religious leaders because they don't like Jesus. And their teaching can be summarised very simply, Jesus is not who he says he is. Jesus is not who he says he is. Watch out for that. Suck a little bit of that in and you'll be completely changed. Suck a little bit of that in and you won't be dealing with the real Jesus. Uh, it, th- those kind of messages can reduce Jesus. Jesus isn't enough. Those kind of messages can dismiss Jesus. He's not worth listening to. Those kind of messages can distract from Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus is really like. Whatever they are, in essence, they take people away from Jesus. They reduce him to a performing pony. They mistake him for a revolutionary. They limit him to good deeds and good words. And all of them are dangerous yeast, aren't they? And they will completely transform you if you suck them in. Matthew is more than halfway through his good news biography. I'm at point five on the outline. Uh, He's got a key idea. God's promised king is Jesus and his heart and action is for the outsider. Jesus has been revealed in all aspects of his life as a child, as an adult, in public and in private. Jesus' character has been made clear. He has a gut-churning compassion for human beings. Jesus' mission has been made clear. Bring rest, bring healing to the sick, bind up the broken, find the lost who've decided that being God instead of God is enough to deal with all humans. And his humanity is clear. He gets tired, he needs tucker, he needs to have a nap, he's worn out. But he's unique. He's God in the flesh. He can calm chaotic creation. He can heal broken people. He can feed thousands. He can look the devil in the eye and tell him to go away. His message is clear. God's king is here. Turn around and meet him. Matthew has revealed so much of who Jesus is. The time for discernment is here. What will you do with that God-given evidence? Now remember, discernment is a skill. It's something you learn. And as you spend more time with Jesus, you will have the evidence God gives to be discerning about. That's that's why this is after 15 chapters, isn't it? It's not in chapter 1. But we have met Jesus And we need to exercise our discernment based on what we've been given. Jesus, no more, no less, there is enough there. So let me ask you this question before I close. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to decide about this man with a gut-churning compassion for broken people like us? But Matthew takes us further, doesn't he? He helps us see some possible threats, and I want to close very quickly with this. Beware of the danger of more. Jesus is enough. There is no more. In our day and age, you can see this danger in these kind of areas. If Jesus was only here today, I'd believe. Well, they didn't in his day, did they? And we've got all the evidence we need. Or the expectation that Jesus will provide more than what is already crystal clear. Jesus, will you give me more than feed me, heal me, bind me up, rest me, love me? 
Or perhaps it's the idea that there's actually more to life than Jesus. And that what Jesus offers is somehow deficient. Jesus is about being a shepherd. Jesus is about the compassion we need. Jesus is the doctor who can deal with our brokenness. Jesus is the servant who provides us with rest. Jesus does not offer financial prosperity, perfect physical health, mansions of magnificence, or a life free of discomfort. But he does offer to be a compassionate shepherd who binds us up, gives us what we need, all by dealing with our brokenness. Beware the distraction of the mundane. The religious leaders looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and said, we want more. The disciples looked at the feeding of the 5,000 and said, not enough. They forgot the sufficiency of Jesus. They become so distracted by their empty lunchbox that they forgot that Jesus gives all his people need. Uh, Let me tell you, we can be distracted by the mundane, can't we? We can be distracted by the mundane, and so our discernment is that Jesus is not enough. Uh, That can happen in all areas of our life, in our work choices, our retirement, our family, our health, our leisure, our education, our social networks, the information we suck in. But look at Jesus He is enough. He is enough. He is sufficient. Beware the dangerous message, the message that says Jesus is not really who he says he is, that reduces him, dismisses him, distorts him. Might only be little, but like yeast, it'll change the whole life. Nothing's changed. He's a good man, a revolutionary, a political rebel, a wise man, a teacher, a martyr, a provider of quotes, a dusty figment of your imagination, a crutch that you can hobble along on. They all reduced him, don't they? They're yeast. Instead, just open the Bible and deal with him as he is. Walking in history, attested to, sufficient. The skill of discernment as God's people will begin when we are familiar with Jesus. And we will see that he is enough. There is no more. And he is exactly as he says he is. Let me pray. Father, give us discernment. Uh, Give us discernment by knowing Jesus as he is. Father, please apply that to us daily, consistently, holistically, in every part of our life. And we pray that as that happens... People in this town and this area will see that Jesus is enough and he provides what we need as people. Amen.